The following interview was conducted with Diana Hardy for the Purdue University Libraries. It takes place on September 8, 2014 at the Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Joining us is Sammy Morris, head of the Archives and Special Collections. Hi. When and where did you grow up and what was the community that you lived in like? Um, I was born and raised in Logansport, Indiana, um, March 12th, 1958. Uh, I lived in Lafayette, or lived in Logansport all my life. Um, moved to Lafayette then in uh, 1977 after graduating from high school and joined, I went to um, Ivy Tech um, Community College. Um, I had always wanted to be a dental assistant. I had braces when I was growing up and so was interested in the dental field. Um, moved to Lafayette then um, to begin training at Ivy Tech. Um, graduated from Ivy Tech then in 1978. Uh, Logansport was um, um, home. Uh, my parents lived there up until um, we all, my father moved to Florida finally uh, a few years back, but uh, my parents and had been born and raised in Logansport as well, and Logansport was home. Um, it, the city itself has changed um, trem uh, quite a bit since I was since I was a kid. We um, uh, graduated from. I was very active in high school. I was active with the um, Thespian Society with the music. I played in the band and. Um, I was actually a rainbow girl, so if you are familiar with uh, Eastern Star and Masonic, and the Masonic Lodge, I was active with, I was a rainbow girl, so I followed my grandparents' uh, footsteps in, um, in the Masonic Lodge, and, um, yeah. Neat. And when you say that you were a really good girl in high school, what do you mean by that? Oh, I was I was not not an exceptional student, but I was involved in lots of different activities. I was very, like I said, I was active with the band. Um, but I was the good girl because I was the rainbow girl. I was the one that didn't, you know, get in trouble. And I had a job when I was 14 years old working at McDonald's, uh, the first job I ever had, uh, making a dollar an hour. So. I've um, my I've always felt like my work ethics and my um, background in the work the in in working class was um, I had a good model. My father was um, a construction worker, had worked construction for years, um, like 40, 45 years. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I had uh, an older brother and a younger brother. Um, both. Um, we're very close family. My mother passed away 20, 20 years ago. Uh, my father's been remarried uh, for the second time. Um, and like I said, he lives in Florida now. So I was a good girl. I was, you know, I had a lot of, I actually, you've heard this, you've heard um, stories about kids that feel like have the second child, middle child syndrome. I I did have the middle child syndrome. I was having two brothers to compete against was, you know, I had to be the uh, tomboy with my older brother and throwing the football and um, throwing it correctly and playing playing ball with him and as well. But then my younger brother was uh, really active and had lots of buddies and lots of friends. But we were closer, my younger brother and I were closer in age, so we kind of spent a lot of time together. Um, in high school as well, so and he he lives in Lafayette as well. Works at Purdue, also. And how did your interest turn to firefighting? Well, uh, when I <clears throat> had gotten um, was going through my training at Ivy Tech, the um, instructor for the um, dental program was also the instructor for the EMT class. Um, so to have victims for the EMT class to, um, for extra credit, you could volunteer to be victims for the EMT class. So I um, did that and became interested in the EMT field. Uh, after graduating from Ivy Tech, then I went back and uh, took the EMT class 
through Ivy Tech and became certified EMT. Uh, moved to a place across the street from the fire station on Klondike Road and thought, um, what a perfect uh, opportunity to, you know, begin to give, give to the community and do some community service. So I joined the, went over and filled out an application and was told that as um, a member of Wabash Township Fire Department, you had to become a firefighter before you could be an EMT. Mm-hmm which meant that if you responded to a car accident and it and there was fire involved they wanted you to have the fire training so you couldn't just do an em you just couldn't just be an emt so i started becoming very active with the volunteer uh, volunteer department and as it turned out because i lived right across the street i was usually the first one there that was driving the trucks to the scene and um was I was an officer with the, um, um, I was secretary and become very, very active. Well, several of the firefighters that were on Wabash Township were also Purdue firefighters. Um, So I kind of, the more I became interested in the fire service and realized, you know, that that was a, a potential career. Um, I had a lot of encouragement from a lot of the firefighters that were on Wabash that were also Purdue and would see, um, you know, that they were only working 10 days a month and the pay was pretty good. And um, so I started really thinking about it, even, you know, with the encouragements that I had from the from the guys that, um, you know, to try to, to consider it and think about it. Um, so I really spent a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of time thinking about whether that was really what I wanted to do. How long did you volunteer? Oh, I was a volunteer with Wabash Fire Department for probably 15 years total. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. um, I, I joined Wabash Volunteer Fire Department, so I've joined uh, early 79, um, graduated from Ivy Tech in 78, um, uh, became an EMT early 79 and joined the summer of 79. Okay. So, and I was hired at Purdue then in 1981. Oh, so okay. I had gotten a lot of training. Wabash Township is probably one of the, at that time was um, um, doing doing some really good work with training and, and you know, had had a really great department. A lot of, a lot of really neat people. Um, and and to, even today, Wabash Township is probably one of the premier volunteer departments even in the state. Hmm. And when you were in the process of making that decision on whether or not to go for it, did you discuss it with your colleagues, and did anybody kind of give you a little push? Um, actually, that's interesting because my brothers, uh, as it turned out to be his father-in-law, was an officer with Purdue Fire Department. Um, His name was Don Weiss. Um, So um, his daughter and I worked at a pizza joint together. Um, And she was, you know, I would go over to her house and Don Weiss was also encouraging and, you know, also giving me, you know, ideas and, and, no, you'll love it, eh," talking to me about, um, about the department itself. And so I was you know, spending a lot of time gathering information and talking with people and deciding whether it was something that I really was was interested in. It was it was a pretty big step. If if I'm, I'm my personality is that once I decide to do something, if it's you know I'm I'm I, I'm going to stay on that road. I'm not. Um, but I had to decide in my heart, and I and I really had to decide whether it was something I wanted to do. I wasn't going to, if I was going to do it, if I was going to put an application in, you know, that was kind of the final step. Mm-hmm. Putting, if I put my application in, I was not going to fail. Mm-hmm. And would, in the process of putting your application in, so you put an application in, and then do you, is there some special program that you join? And is that how you... Um, well, the difference in, in um, Purdue Department and the city departments a lot of the, especially the big city departments, they send you to a um, fire academy. Um, Purdue at Purdue, you 
have to have experience. So you have to have like been ill in the fire department or been in the military or been with a volunteer of some sort to um, be hired at Purdue. So they required you to have the experience. Um, <clears throat> so um, they don't have the facilities to train you, so that mm -hmm. was part of the requirement too. And they were also, the an EMT um, had an ambulance service at that time. They started their ambulance service probably 74 or so. They were, um, um, it's pro it's one of the premier, one of the only universities in the country that have a department like that. So you, you took the road to being a firefighter and and the response, the EMT responsibilities. So did they ever come back, or did you ever go back in that EMT direction, or were you just pretty much firefighter? Well, at Purdue, you, you do both. Okay. Yeah, you have to be both. You have to have the, the um, you have to be a firefighter, you have to be trained as a firefighter, and you have to be an EMT as well, because we do rotate to different positions. So you're not always on the ambulance, or not mm -hmm. always on the fire truck. Um, I would tell the story about um, applying for the position because there were rumors um, around the department that I was interested, that I was thinking about or considering it. And so they were, you know, kind of, they were kind of like, well, what do we do and how do we go about doing this? And prior to me applying for the position, there was no physical agility test. If they hired you, you came in and gave your application to the chief, and if you know one or two persons on the department knew you, then you were hired, and that was basically all there was to the hiring process. Um, so they came up with a physical agility test, lo and behold, um, which prior to that there was no agility at all. Um, and they kind of struggled with that because they weren't sure, you know, how to, where to come up with that agility. Did they, I know that they talked to a couple uh, different other, like Indianapolis and some of the larger cities and what they did and kind of tried to base it off of some other experience um, that other departments were, were having. Um, so I had to run a mile and a half in 12 minutes. Um, I was not a runner. Not at all, and I spent, uh, I probably ran every day for a year before I took the agility, and that was the other thing, the searching and um, trying to decide whether it was something I was going to do because, again, I said I wasn't going to fail. So I wasn't going to fail in that I wasn't going to not pass the agility. If I put my application in, I was going to work hard to, to prove that you know that I was capable of doing the job. Well, and the physical agility tests across the country have changed a lot over the years. You know, for one thing, you don't run a mile and a half to a, to a fire. Um, and so, <laughs> and and I can claim that there were probably a number of the guys on the department at the time that could not have ran a mile and a half in twelve minutes. Yeah, um, and I'm I, and some of them could. You know, I'm not saying that not that none of them could, but there were there were a lot. There were a few that probably could not have done it. Um, and there were other things that I had to um, carry um, an inch and a half um, roll of hose across a beam to make sure that my balance was okay. And I had to do uh, 25 setups and 10 pull-ups. Um, I, I know that there was probably a few other hoops and things that I had to do, but um, basically the, the mile and a half run was the one thing that I knew was, was going to be very hard. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the, um, when I did, I had performed the, um, the, the, tried to perform the task at one point and had a chest cold. Um, the fire chief had taken me to the um, outdoor running track, um, and it was in the middle of the afternoon, um, and I had a chest cold, and so he could tell that by the time I had gotten halfway through that, you know, I was, it was really difficult for me. Well, they, uh, of course, gave me another chance, 
and so another, I think it was probably a month later or three weeks later or something, um, I ended up performing, um, completing, completing the mile and a half in 12 minutes. Um, I was in really good shape. I mean, I was, I was running and physically working and I was riding a bike all the time. I would get on my bicycle and ride from, um, the place where I lived and on Klondike Road to the mall. So I was very active. Um, can you talk about organizations that you've been in that help promote the advancement of women and how you got involved in those organizations? Oh, yes. One of the... Um, <laughs> I give a lot of credit to, it was an organization it's called Women in the Fire Service. It's actually um, kind of progressed and changed into a, it's called I Women now. But at the time, uh, Women in the Fire Service had, um, was just beginning to be, it was a brand new organization. Uh, the two women that kind of put the organization together and started doing outreach and getting the word out and contacting as many departments in the area as they could uh, was Terry Florin, uh, who was in Ohio, and uh, Linda Willing, who lived in, uh, was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado Fire Department. Um, so that was, uh, I attended the first Women in the Fire Service Conference in 1985. Uh, walking into the uh, room of 150 women in Boulder, Colorado was very emotional for me. It was, it was, I used to call it, I used to refer to it as recharging my battery because it was something that I really, you know, it was very helpful, very helpful to, to walk into, into a room and realize that all these women were doing the same thing you were doing and the out and the mentoring and the, um, uh, camaraderie and the, the talking with other women was just, was, was very, very helpful. How did you find out about that organization? Oh, you know, that was a story. Um, one, uh, there was a gentleman that worked at Purdue at the time that was uh, involved in a state organization, had come back from um, a meeting that he had been to and had given me the name, had shared the name with me. Um, that was a long time ago. You know, I, just, I, I know that they contacted me through... Um, they were just trying to, it was very hard for them to get the name out and to, to you know, recruit and, and ask for women. Uh, in 1981 or in the early 19, well, the first woman was hired in, um, in the United States in 1974, and that was in Virginia. Uh, her, um, Mary, um, Mary was her name. It's not coming to me. Um, so uh, at the time then, there were a few women that were going through um, litigation uh, and suing the New York Fire Department. And New York women were finally put on the job in 1982. So in 1981, it was very, um, there were very few women across the country. When you, when you put your application in, did you know that you were the first or one of the first? In the well, case? yes, I did, but, you know, that really wasn't part of, I, I, it really wasn't, you know, it was a job. Mm -hmm. um, I've told that story a few times recently that it was, I had no idea what what legacy and, and what what I was really getting myself into because it was, it was something I wanted to do. It was a dream. It was it was something that I really w was interested in. And it wasn't that, you know, sure, I knew I was the only one and knew I was the first, but, you know, I still wanted to be treated equally. I still wanted to walk in and be treated equally and, be, and do the same job that everybody else was doing. And, um, you know, I, I, it, that's just wasn't part of my thought process back then. Mm -hmm. hmm. And can you talk about what a typical day as a firefighter is like? Uh, well, we work a 24-hour shift. So we work um, worked a, what we called our three days on. And it was actually a nine-day rotation. So if we worked a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
um, then we would have four days off. So we'd come in at seven in the morning and you wouldn't get off work until seven the next morning. Um, so it was actually, it, when, it, when you added up the hours, it was a 56 hour work week. So by that, we, we, but we were sleeping, you know, as much as, you know, five or six hours a night. Although uh, a lot of times there was, uh, a lot of times you'd be up two or three times in the middle of the night um, with calls. Um, but in the mornings, we would come in at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you would check, check your truck out, whatever position you were on for that day. Um, you know, check the lights, check the equipment, uh, make sure you had your gear, then you placed your gear on the truck. Everyone has, had a, a radio, so each radio was designated as your radio. Uh, you would put that on, on the trucks. Um, back in the early years, um, we didn't have individual radios. So each radio was transferred from one shift to the other, so you would have to make sure it was charged and ready to go for that day. Um, uh, and then we would have radio check. We used to have a radio check every morning at 7 o'clock. Um, they changed that um, quite a few years ago. We started doing that on a Sunday. So every Sunday morning you did radio check. Um, I've heard people tell stories that they would get up um, wake up to our radio check at seven o'clock in the morning that it was their wake up call um, and and then we would have morning a morning meeting at usually eight or eight thirty depending on um, if it was a Sunday or Saturday or Sunday um, the day is usually designated as your day it wasn't really a work day if it was Monday through Friday then we usually have some sort of training either in the morning or in the afternoon or both um, because we are not only EMTs we are aircraft crash rescue trained so we were doing training um, um, airport training um, hazmat training we were hazmat uh, everyone is uh, hazmat certified uh, which means that uh, we anytime we had a chemical spill or something that um, something happened in one of the labs at Purdue we would be putting on the you know the fully encapsulated with the air pack and so we were trained in, in that we were also trained in um, trench rescue and rope rescue um, or we were doing some some sort of training with the trucks whether it be with the aerial the um, 100 foot aerial or with the either the pumper you know training for um, um, high rise fires and anything that was I can't imagine that training you know you're trained on it and you figure out how to do it but in such an adrenaline charged situation how you apply what you learn is it just through practice it seems like accidents are so inconsistent in the way they happen um, yeah I think it's consistency um, you know when you're working when you're driving through campus too and the students are everywhere, you know, you have to really be, you know, you have to be aware of everything. Uh, and yes, the adrenaline, I, I can remember one of the first fire calls that I went on as a volunteer. Um, dry, it was, I had a stick shift at the time and my legs were, my legs were literally shaking enough that, you know, I couldn't, I, I had trouble shifting using the clutch and shifting because I was so, you know, had that adrenaline rush. But I think that wears off pretty quickly. Does it? Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, huh. yeah. But yeah, that is, um, and again, you know, in, in the middle of the night when you're woke up, you know, the alarms come on and the lights come on and you're rushing out and if it's a young child or a reported smoke visible or something, you know, you get used to that, and I think that kind of fades, that kind of fades a lot because it's not, you know, you kind of think, oh, yeah, okay, well, smoke, and it's not always, it's not always as bad as you think it, it is. Um, so then, you know, when you're, during your normal day, then you have training, and then you have, 
some downtime or dinner time? Or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we usually had lunch time between either 12, 12 and 1, one thirty, um, and then training a lot of times would start at 1 or one thirty. Uh, but then at 4 o'clock, it was pretty much your time. So any time after 4 o'clock, if you chose to wash your vehicle or, um, you know, do any any personal business, that was um, that was the time, the time that you could do those things is after 4 o'clock. Like wash your personal vehicle? Oh, sure. Really? Oh, sure. Oh. Yeah, I didn't, fire, firefighters have the cleanest vehicles. <laughs> Yeah. Of all those hoses around? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, firefighters have the cleanest vehicles. I've traveled some across um, Europe and done some uh, traveling overseas, and that's one of the things that I always got such a kick out of. You'd go into a fire station in London, and they'd all be washing their vehicles out back. Yeah. Clean cars, oh. yes. That's and they were usually yeah. red, too. <laughs> Great. And then, so, can you talk about the communal dinners that you would have? Yes. Um, then after, um, at, at 4 o'clock, we would you, a lot of times decide what we were, what we were going to have for dinner um, as a, you know, who likes what and if we're going to order pizza or what we might get or just get takeout. And there were some people that would bring their own meals in, so it was kind of inconsistent. It wasn't all the time. Um, there's There are some shifts. In fact, there's some shifts at Purdue now that have communal dinners together all the time. And it's a real social, you know, event because you're sitting at the table if you've had, you know, something that might have happened during the day or um, maybe somebody's not getting along with someone else. It was the time to kind of air those out and kind of sit and, and talk about the day or joke and talk about what might have happened or share stories. That was, um, yeah, the fire station is, is um, and that's, you know, that's the little kids um, um, where they kind of think about fire stations and sitting around the table drinking coffee and having meals together and it's true it does happen i can imagine that such a close environment can be a blessing and a curse sometimes too to work so be so close with your yes. colleagues yes you learn you learn people's personality and and oh yeah yeah <clears throat> you know you have people that if they're if you're cooking a meal, they don't want onions or they don't want, you know, spicy or they don't don't eat vegetables and yeah, you're you're accommodating certain uh, personalities and certain eating habits and yeah, there's um get to know you get to know people when you're sleeping in the bunk room and you can hold out you know reach out and the guy right next to you is less than three or four feet away from you and he snores really bad or his feet smell or um yeah you learn you learn a lot about people <laughs> close quarters i bet um well can you um Think about a, a specific time that you were really challenged or if there was a, a particular events that stick out in your mind as kind of highlights when you were here. Oh, um, I, th I think the one story that I wanted to tell um, happened actually my last 24-hour shift. Um, it was... <laughs> I, I really believe that someone put this little girl in my in my path that day because it was um, one of my favorite meals is spaghetti and it, as it turned out the one guy that doesn't care for spaghetti wasn't there that day so it was decided that we were going to have spaghetti so I was the um, person that was driving the truck to go out and purchase what we needed for the spaghetti for that day um, and so I'm standing at the grocery store in front of the meat counter and realize that there's a little girl off the to the side of me watching me and intently watching me and it just took me by surprise because she kept watching me and finally I turned and walked over to her and put my arm around her and put you know put my own arm on her shoulder and talked to her for a minute and 
her mother finally says to me that she's, and her eyes are just, just big. Her eyes are huge. And her mother finally says to me that she saw you in the parking lot and said to her mom, look, mom, there's a woman firefighter. And it really didn't occur to me until later that evening or even the next day how that had impacted me and how that had, you know, changed the whole retiring um, that, you know, I, just to influence that little girl and to have her be so moved and so um, just just in awe of my uniform and that I was a firefighter and that was my last 24-hour shift. I wish I had that moment back. I really wish that I could go back to that little girl and say, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Um, I'd love to find her. You know, I, I would love to to talk with her and to show her that, you know, that this is possible, that you can be who, whoever you want. It just, it it's really affected my whole, you know, outlook. And not realizing what I, over the years, you know, I have, I you know, I've made it a point whenever we had children and kids that came from the child care, from Purdue child care, it got to the point where, um, when they were bringing the kids over, they would request that they come on the day that I was there because they, you know, that was part of, I loved doing that. I loved doing that. I always felt like that was part of my job and part of a responsibility that I had to um, little girls and little boys, but little girls to show them that, you know, you can do this. You can be a firefighter. You can be whoever you want. You can be... You can be strong, you can wear a uniform, you can, you know, you can do this. Um, and that same, uh, was two, I think the day later, a day after that as well, I was shopping in the grocery store again, and the woman that is the um, head of the um, child care, Purdue Child Care, says to me, I didn't know you retired, and she was very disappointed that now that, that I wasn't going to be there at the station to spend time and to talk with the kids. I always had a routine, you know, I always had a, a, a way of going through my routine. I kept a, um, a package of matches in my pocket and I would tell, I would tell the kids, you know, what, it, what is it that children should never, never, never play with? And they were always able to tell me what that was and and then I would talk about stop, drop, and roll, and um, having a meeting place, and and what a fire alarm looks like, and you know they were. Um, it just it was important to me. It was very important to me. So to have this other, have her see me in the in the store the next day too was like, oh my, you know this is just going to um, this is like a, a snowball rolling downhill because. You know, I just really, it just had, didn't occur to me how how I had influenced and affected and, and been part of the community for so long. It was a job, you know, it was a paycheck, it was a job. So I didn't, I, I just didn't realize how, and for, for the um, archives, for you, for you to contact me and to say, you know, we want to, we want to put you up on a mantle and <laughs> look at you and I, it's just been really, it's been really really kind of neat great and then what about like day to day and how many lives have you saved and the, the day to day um, activities of being a firefighter any memories of those oh um, I think one of the one of the memories that always comes to mind is um well, there's been a lot of tragic events, you know. There's been a lot of things that um, were not very pretty, and you don't like to you don't like to think about, and you don't want to uh, recall those. And that's part of the fire service is the humor, the fire fire department humor. Is you, um, I wouldn't say make a joke of it, but you, but it's the way of getting through those, you know, the post traumatic stress, and um, you have to you have to learn to that it's still, again, it's the job. It's it's what we're doing. It's the job. 
So I think one of the one of the early stories that really stuck with me, and this was like the first couple, this was the first I don't know two years that I was on the department. It was Easter, um, and we had gotten a call. It was late at night. I don't know twelve thirty one o'clock in the morning. Um, for it was actually for sh a shooting that occurred. Uh, it was over at Purdue Village, over at Married Student Courts at that time that we got over there and it was a husband and wife that had been out drinking and had come home. Um, he was actually an ROTC uh, um, at Purdue and they had argued and she um, had gotten the shotgun away, from, uh, it was a shotgun, gotten the shotgun away from him and was hitting it on the um, kitchen sink and it discharged and went through her leg. And this was, early, I mean, this was, a, you know, early 80s, 84, 83, um, that we, at that time, we were still using shock pants. So we immediately put shock pants on her. He had taken a telephone cord and wrapped a telephone cord around her leg. But it was a pretty significant injury, and she ended up losing her leg. But, um, I mean, I, that's the one, the one when I think of a horrible, horrible um, scene that's, I guess the one thing that comes to mind, but it, being Easter, um, and I was, you know, I was young and getting back to the fire station and um, debriefing or talking about the the uh, the run. I can remember Bob Smith standing in the office and saying, um, wishing us happy Easter, and <laughs> I just had that sick feeling in my stomach when he said that to me because to realize, you know, Easter any holiday is important you know when you're growing up and the easter egg hunts and christmas and all the all the holidays are important to kids but um it just i think about how that that feeling in my stomach and i didn't throw up i didn't lose my cookies as they say but i was pretty close and that was really the only there were a few other instances where there was a lot of blood and and the um uh, the smell of blood um, for people in, in emergency services has a distinct smell to it that, um, you know, I can still smell, I can still kind of remember that smell as well. Um, the one child, uh, the delivery, the baby that we delivered, I can, I can remember that smell of delivering that child. It was, a, a, again, a woman at uh, Purdue Village was trying to wait on her husband to get home um, from class and she had already had two children and she clearly had waited too long um, because we had just barely got in the door and um, Dale, uh, who I was with Dale that day, hollers at me to get the, the kit, you know, the, that we carry and by the time I came back into the room she had already delivered. She had it was on the welcome mat at the front door as well, so she had one foot on one side of the door frame and the other on the other on the other side of the door frame. So she delivered the child right on the welcome mat at the front door. Um, but of course, he had um, we um, delivered the child, and I took the child then over to um, wrapped it in a blanket, and that was pretty that was pretty interesting, pretty cool, you know, to actually be right there and deliver that child and there's you know there's other oh, I don't know that we didn't really have um, a lot of um, car accidents you know people think that EMS and fire services car accidents and you know wrapping a car around a telephone pole and that sort of thing but we didn't really um, being a university department and university you know we don't have the high-speed car accident situations but one the one um, bad car accident that I can remember was when the kids um, was during Grand Prix week and again alcohol was involved um, um, ran up on the hill and it's um, was out there off of um, off of airport road to and the car turned over onto the kids so there was a carload of kids that had been um, I don't remember how many were killed, but there were several that were killed. Um, uh, another another 
situation, we were called to a um, accident on um, on the bridge between West Lafayette and Lafayette. And it was icy, and it was early morning, and it was icy, and I think it was another I'm trying to remember, but it was another holiday, maybe even Easter. I don't remember, but um, they were. Um, to two young kids and a and a child in the car, and um, that was another one that kind of sticks with me because the the little child was in the back seat, and um, as we're working on the two in the front seat, the child in the back seat had already was was pronounced dead, um, but no one had 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 the time to cover her up, and I'm, you know, there wasn't much else to look at but that little child in the back seat but that was you know those things those things stick with you they they are part of but they're part of the job and um i mean there's there's lots i've lots of stories over the over the years lots of kids that um you know they're they're 1200 miles away from their parents and they're away from home for the first time and you know they don't feel well, or they have something that's bothering some issue with their health, and uh, so we're the we're the we're the parent. We come become the parent for that for that half an hour or an hour that we take them to the emergency room, or decide whether is it is it important enough to take you to the emergency room. And then we had kids that weren't even 18 yet um, when they can come to Purdue, so we had to, we would have to. You know, if they're away from home and they're not 18, we would have to contact the parents. And um, yeah, there's been lots of uh, lots of those calls in the middle of the night where they've had a stomach ache and they've been, you know, they have the flu, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but mom and dad aren't there, and so who do they call? Um, 911, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had, you know, you kind of had to take the good with the bad. Sometimes those were not fun, and sometimes you had to say, well, to yourself. And that was when we would get back in the truck and we could joke with each other about um, and complain about, um, you know, why are they calling me at 3 in the morning when they've been throwing up all day? And um, <laughs> But it happens. It happens all the time. Or you get thrown up on, and they vomit all over you, and they've been out partying all night, and... Um, you know, they just, they're experimenting. You remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the, psych- the psychological training that you had? I mean, to build up that kind of thick skin and carry that stuff around, do they train you for that? Or you just learn that on the job as you go? Well, um, and that's kind of progressed and changed and grown into um, a whole different aspect of the fire services having debriefings and having, um, you know, sessions that if you have um, some really bad um, trauma, some really bad incidents. There's been a few things at Purdue that, you know, when the uh, parent, when the mother pushed her, um, threw her kids off of the top of the parking garage, you know, you have those things. And, you know, there's, there's, um, there's lots of help out there. You have the, um, um, the Purdue um, employee assistance is um, a good a good place to start. Um, no, I think that um, you kind of learn that um, not not taking it home, not not carrying it with you, and talking about it in the fire station. Again, that was part of the the social um, aspect of the fire services. You know, having if you're having trouble, is to ask for help. Um, yeah, that's. I get. I, I. I don't know. Thick skinned, yes, but I think we kind of. It's. It's the personality of a firefighter too. Is, is having that uh, ability to not, you know, let it let it continually bother you because if that does, I mean, you, you just can't. You can't do that. And so you started out as the only woman there, and I bet you you saw some changes as the years progressed. How long were you the only female firefighter? Um, well, the first woman, or the uh, the first sec, second woman, I'm sorry, 
was hired, and I'm trying to think, Teresa Williams was hired in late 1980. So it was about 88, 89. And she didn't stay very long. She stayed, I think, five, five years. It was, um, she had young children at home, and so she felt a responsibility and felt like it was too much time to be away from her kids. Um, so she left the department. Uh, and then um, the, over the years, we've had a number of different, uh, Teresa and another woman that was there for 10 years. Um, currently, there are three. There were three woman, women plus myself. Um, Dana um, Wislocki just retired. She'd been there ten years. Um, she uh, left the department uh, mostly because um, it was a, a kind of a recurring back injury, um, and so she was able to leave after 10 years. We're vested after 10 years, so she was able to still uh, receive a pension. Um, and then now there are two women that are still there, Dana, or uh, Dawn and uh, Athena. Uh, they both have families, they both have children and families and um, are married. One is a paramedic and the um, Athena is actually training to be a paramedic at this time, so she's um, in another year or so, she should be, she should qualify to be a paramedic as well. And what, when you were not the only female working there anymore, was that, was that a... Competition? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, it was. It was. I think women generally are not nice to each other, you know, across the board. You know, they kind of sabotage things and talk about, well, so-and-so can't do that. And um, that became a little bit of a competition because I'm not one to, um, I wouldn't say bow down, but I wasn't one to stroke them, you know, and they, and they liked that. They really liked that. They mm -hmm. wanted somebody to kind of take care of them. And, they, um, and Teresa's, I'm friends with Teresa now, but she used to bring in cheesecake all the time and bake cookies and stuff and I'm I'm just not like that I just didn't do that I didn't feel like you know even in the beginning I didn't need to um, it took a lot of uh, psychological I don't know repair I guess because women are not supposed to be hard-nosed and and act like well you know I don't give a shit if you don't like me tough but I kind of carried that around a little bit and until I had received some help with employee assistance and had talked to talked to them a, a number of times that if uh, Gary Cook didn't like me it wasn't my fault you know I really had to I, it, that was a real learning process for me because you know I was from the old school I was from the my parents that told me you know that you should be the kind caring you know, in, in the kitchen and baking cookies and making cheesecake, and that wasn't me at all. Um, so yeah, that was that was a process, and um, I think they kind of learned, they kind of figured that out pretty early when I when I came into the fire department that they weren't gonna, you know, they tried to push me around or tried to, you know, act like, you know, I was not, I don't know. All that. That goes into a lot of different <laughs> Dynam dynamics. dynamics yes. psyche, yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of your parents, how did your parents um, react to your career aspirations as a firefighter? Did they encourage you or discourage you? Or? Um, well, I think my my grandparents were probably the ones that had more of a difficulty. Um, I think my mother. Um, encouraged me but she I think she still really didn't quite understand the whole you know firefighter I didn't have I had no brothers or uncles or relatives that had been in the fire service so they had nothing really to you know it was just what they knew from reading in the paper or from from you know fire the fire service what they knew they they had no um, knowledge of what it was like and I remember um, and this goes with a lot of questions, I guess, in the beginning were um, the sleeping arrangements. 
you know, were, well, you know, how, they just didn't understand that. They just didn't quite understand that. And the guys laughed about all the, uh, why, um, or the guys that I worked with, wives that were coming in because they wanted to see me, you know, that first week, you know, they wanted to see who their, or their husbands were sleeping with. Uh, I had no clue. I had no idea that these women didn't all, always come in. But these were women that had probably never been in the fire station before, but they wanted to come in and see what I looked like and see what <laughs> see what they were up against. And um, so, yeah, um, and I finally had to tell my mother, I finally had to have a conversation with her and say, you know, Mom, it's no different than me wearing a bathing suit. If I'm getting out of bed in the middle of the night you know, I have a sh- T-shirt on. At the time, I was I uh, later in my career, I always wore a bra to bed, so it wasn't like I was going on. It wasn't like I was going on calls without a bra on either. But um, you know, it's no different than a bathing suit. So they kind of that kind of went a, went a wasn't quite quite as much of a conversation after that, but. Um, and some of the guys, you know, they chose to take their sh- T-shirts off, but they still wore, you know, underwear or, or boxer shorts or, or gym shorts. A lot of them wore gym shorts to bed. But, um, yeah, I think the sleeping arrangements were the one thing that um, that they were confused and had issues with. Interesting. And and what about the, the facilities conundrum? Was there a big deal made out of that um the women's restroom what was that like <laughs> the remodeling experience yes yes well when the fire station was built uh the fire station was built in 1963 um late late 1963 so when it was built it was built without a women's bathroom so there were no facilities even for wives or, or family members that would come to the fire station so it was basically a locker room separated by a um a revolve what i call it was called the revolving door so it had like saloon kind of doors on them that that would move well when i started then on the department they had um it was two stalls and then two urinals, uh, two sinks and two showers, uh, but no separate facilities. If I was in the bathroom, you know, the guys, if they were coming in and using the bathroom, what they did was they took a um, piece of metal, made a piece of metal that would come down and keep the doors from opening so that it said occupied on it. It had it was a piece of metal that flipped down, and so if I was in the bathroom, I was to flip that that down right, so that they knew I was in the bathroom. And the story the story that I like to tell was one of the guys in the shop that um, back in the uh, back part of the station were um, what we called fire equipment services, and they took care of fire alarms and and. Um, fire extinguishers and that sort of thing so they were just an eight to five group they didn't they were there just during the day well one of them I was in the stall and one of the guys from from back in the shop came and sat down in the stall next to me and saw that um, my little tiny shoes and was scared got up and left right and so we teased him about that for quite a while he 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 was just horrified that I was sitting in the stall next to him because I, you know, I wasn't going. If they wanted needed to come in and use the restroom, I wasn't going to keep them from doing that. So they finally realized that I wasn't going anywhere, um, that I was going to be there. Um, so they took, um, basically, took a closet and made a bathroom out of the closet. It was uh, large, just large enough for three lockers. Uh, it had a sink and a toilet, but it had a little. It had a pretty nice shower, but it was really basically just a closet. So if there were any more than three women that they wanted to hire a fourth woman, there was no locker space for them. So in this bathroom, then it was closer, um, closer to the officers' quarters and closer to the TV room. So when I was not on duty. Um, they were using that bathroom. 
so I, the story goes that I came in to work some overtime, and the officer that was in charge that day, Mick Denhart, didn't know I was in the station. In the in the station. Well, one of the um, guys that was there sitting at the table, he's like, Mick is in. So he's pointing towards the bathroom, and finally I realized he was tr- telling me that Mick was in there in the bathroom using the bathroom. So I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. So I walked into the bathroom, came up right behind him, and he's using the bathroom, right? I mean, he's peeing. <laughs> came up behind him and, and you know, tapped him on the shoulder and asked him what he was doing, and he was horrified. He was horrified. He talked about that for years after that. I could probably still remind him about that, and he would remember it. Um, and so it's just, you know, jokey, funny, you know, entertaining things that happened like that around the fire station that that made the job fun. I didn't mean anything by it, and I didn't see any, you know, I didn't see what he was, I, I knew what he was doing, but I was behind him. I didn't see anything. Uh, there wasn't anything, you know, sexual or whatever about it, but it was just, it was fun to to participate in those kinds of, you know, fun things or throwing water on each other or, you know, getting wet or just doing jokes. I think, oh, another story that I can share with you is, again, it was the sleeping arrangements were um, another place where they could, um, I don't know, play with you you know, have things, put something in your bed, and you get in, and it'd be like creepy, crawly, you know, fuzzy things or whatever. But the first the first night that I slept in the station, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of not, not really quite understanding, you know, how the whole thing was going to go, right? And so, turns out there was about two or three of them that had gone to bed, what I learned later was very early. So they were in there, and they wanted to make sure they were in bed by the time I went to bed, right? So I get in there and go to bed, and I'm laying down in the bed, and, um, you know, it was kind of a scary experience because it was the first night in the fire station, and I'm laying in bed, and I'm thinking, I was having trouble breathing. And... (laughs) I didn't. I probably laid there as long as I could because I just didn't understand, you know, why I was having why it was not uncom- not comfortable. Okay. Turns out, the reason they had gone to bed early was because they had put um, blocks under the end of my bed. Okay, so under the foot of my bed. So if you try to sleep in a bed that has the foot higher than your head, your diaphragm won't let you breathe, okay? So I was having trouble breathing and not realizing, you know, what what the heck was going on? So finally I could hear Ron Mitchell over in the corner just giggling, just laughing so hard he couldn't stand it anymore. He just had to tell me what was going on. And so come to find out that was what they had done. I didn't know. You know, it was a bed that yeah, I didn't know. Pretty technical prank. <laughs> well, it was very simple, yes. Very technical, but very simple. Um, uh, <laughs> they kind of joked later, though, that I couldn't sleep with my feet above my head. That was kind of the, you know, the joke later in li- later in the. In, that was that was kind of fun, though. But you know, they would put things above you and drop like a bag of flour on your head or a bag of rice or put snakes in your rubber snakes in your bed and yeah the bedroom became quite the place to 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 pull the uh to do the jokes oh I caught one one guy one time trying to short sheet my bed and just things like that so they do that to each other too or Uh just to you Uh uh-huh yeah yeah did you do it to them no. no. Oh no, no. No. I may have participated in some jokes here and there and been, you know, helpful in one way or another. But to um to be the prankster, no, no. Huh. No, because I was the good girl. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was the good girl. I wasn't the one that was gonna be, you know, out playing jokes on someone and then have them return that joke and have it backfire and you know. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and what sort of things, what, what interests do you see yourself having now that you have more free time on your hands? Oh, I, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> I really had hoped to do some uh, volunteering. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the CASA program, doing the um, court-appointed um, CASA program. I actually have a job that I'm um, um, starting actually Wednesday with that, is uh, working with the Lafayette Housing Authority, doing inspections um, uh, part-time, two days a week, two to three days a week. Um, I feel like I really want to give back to the community. Um, I intend to join the volunteer department, which is Buck Creek, where I'm at now. The so Volunteer fire department. Mm -hmm, join the Buck Creek Fire Department. Um, and really just to, because I do have free time, I do have a lot of extra free time that I ho I'm hopeful to um, give back to the community and give back to the volunteer department as well and also to uh, keep up my EMT training to um, you know help out help out the department what is the difference between an EMT and a paramedic oh there's quite a bit because the paramedic uh, at Purdue we just went to uh, what's called ALS so advanced life support mm -hmm. Um, because until, um, that's been about 10 years ago that we went to an ALS program because the EMT is very limited in what they can do. Number one, they can't give any medications. You know, you can't do IVs. You can't, um, um, there's, we do have a defibrillator machines that we can use as EMTs. Um, but that has really, I mean, that whole EMS training and the, the, concept of EMS and the whole, um, you know, emergency medical services has changed so much over the 32 years that, um, you know, the paramedics can um, do IVs and um, do quite a bit more than, uh, than what we could do as EMTs. We used to tease when we um, went to an EMS or went to the ALS program that we never killed anybody as EMTs. We just, you know, we got him to the hospital. Hopefully, got him to got him to the hospital alive. Um, but back in the day, if you had um, a situation where you really needed, they really needed advanced life support, and you were on the scene of, say, a cardiac arrest, you would call um, dispatch and have them send a, um, a a paramedic unit, an ALS advanced life support unit. So a lot of times, you know, when we do, when we would have that happen, um, Purdue was very um, forward in their going to ALS because it's really a very, it's a big commitment as far as your, the training that it takes and the paramedic um, program. So we've um, come a long way. Purdue's really come a long way, and we've really been able to help out the students so much more. Um, a lot of we have a lot of diabetics at Purdue, so they um, they're able to give them medications that we as EMTs couldn't do. So we were able to help them out quite a bit, and and where they didn't have to, we didn't have to take them to the hospital. So that was really really a neat um, program that Purdue stepped up and were, was able to uh, give that you know, that extra service. I'm sure parents across the country that are looking at universities, if they have a child that has a medical medical condition or, you know, something where they are concerned about their medical health, um, can look at Purdue and really realize that they are, you know, a big step up where any other university has to rely on the city or the... Um, hospitals and where we're just right there mm -hmm. and they actually pay for that service in their tuition so that they're not you know they're not charged for the, the for our services mm -hmm. we take them to the hospital there's no charge for it oh, wow. mm -hmm. well is there anything that we didn't ask that you wish we did <laughs> 
Oh, geez, I think we've covered quite a bit, haven't we? It's, it's an hour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, go ahead and...